Welcome back to another episode of Trading Secrets. Today, I'm joined by reality TV star turned health and wellness entrepreneur, Lauren Lowe Bosworth. Many of you may recognize Lowe from her time spent on MTV's hit reality TV shows, Laguna Beach and The Hills between 2004 and 2010. After each of the shows wrapped up production, she spun off into the literary world by launching a blog, The Lowdown by Low Bosworth, and wrote a book of the same name, which was released in 2011. After quickly becoming a fan favorite on each of the hit MTV shows, Lo decided to step away from reality TV and begin the next chapter of her life. In 2016, Lo founded a personal wellness brand, Love Wellness, which focuses on women's personal care guided by doctors while offering products that are clean and safe for women. Today, we are going to cover all of her business ventures from Laguna Beach to Love Wellness and everything in between. Lo, thank you so much for being here. We're excited to have you. Thanks for having me. It's so funny to hear your intro like your bio being read by somebody else especially from back when you were like 22 how do you feel about your bio because it's, it's pretty impressive no i think it's kind of cringe wait why <laughs> i don't know <laughs> is it is it the reality tv yeah part? it's a is reality it, tv part really yeah so you look back at that time and you're just like that just makes I'm you kind of so, like i'm so lucky but um i mean you probably know in the early days of reality tv Everyone just really was confused by people on reality TV and they did not have any understanding that we were real people (laughs) or had feelings. And um, it just it was like emotionally challenging. Right. And I started when I was 15 or 16. And yeah, you're like are trying to become an adult and then you're doing it on TV and making mistakes and trying to figure it out <laughs> and that's a, I mean that's a young age to do it when you think about that time period like was entertainment television industry anything on your radar or did you just by chance fall into like casting I really fell into it so okay. at the time the OC the, the scripted show was on um, and it was on the CW or whatever the channel was called back then and we were yeah. mega fans we were like wow this like cool show about Newport and then a year later, MTV showed up on our doorstep at our high school, literally proposing a reality show. And I remember everybody, pretty much everybody, you know, uh, filled out the paperwork or whatever because yeah. we were excited. Yeah. You know, we're only like 15. MTV it's MTV. Shows up to your high school, exactly. Of TRL was, was so big yeah. back then. Yeah, no. And um, my friend Lauren Conrad and I got actually got noticed because we were ditching class <laughs> and we were like trying to escape from school, ditch a class. And Adam DeVello, the executive producer, was like walking up the street and we were walking down the street and we accidentally like set our car alarm off or something. It was like a whole, it was a meet cute <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that really changed, um, changed our lives forever. Uh, but yeah, gosh, it was such a long time ago now. So when they come to your school though, and you know, that happens and then you get casted, I'm thinking your family is probably has some hesitations. Definitely. Like 15, 16. I mean, what was that process like of working through it with your family, working through the business side of the negotiations. Like, what is Mm -hmm. your memory of that? So the very first season of Laguna, we were... We were juniors in high school. We were minors. We had to get, you know, parental buy-in and all of this stuff. And I remember that MTV initially didn't want to pay us anything. Really? (laughs) And there was one lawyer in the group of parents or, you know, sort of like, you know, down the line acquaintances or whatever that caught wind and, you know, advised that we needed, you know, contracts and to be paid. So I think each person maybe made like $3,000 for the first season of Laguna Beach in total. (laughs) Not even per episode, just total. (laughs) That's wild. But for me, I was young. It was a fortune. 3,000 bucks at 15. That's a lot of money. It was a fortune. And I, you know, saved it, just spent a little bit of it over the years. It was a fortune. Um, But it was, there was, there was a lot of hesitation from, from family Mm -hmm. because we just had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. And for good reason, because (laughs) initially everyone was sort of under the impression it was possibly going to be a one episode, true lifestyle. Sure. I'm from Orange County. And it turned into one of the biggest shows 
in reality TV history and, you know, changed how TV was created entirely. And we did not expect that. <laughs> Especially when you look at, like, if you compare a numbers guy, right? Like, ratings now of mm-hmm. shows versus ratings in popularity then. Like, the premiere of The Bachelorette just got, I think it was two point, I don't know, like six or 2.9 million followers. Mm-hmm. I'll brush up on that in the recap. Okay. <laughs> but for you guys at that time, you're getting 10, 20 million viewers. I mean, that yeah. is crazy. So how quickly did things change in your life from the, yeah, we'll give you like 3,000 bucks uh, you know, a season to material dollars that could be life-changing? Yeah. So for me, I suppose it was a few, few years later when I was on the hills because I graduated from high school and went to university and really focused on just being a college student for a couple of years, which is what I always wanted to do. Some other people on the show moved right to right to the hills and kind of jumped into the entertainment world. But I didn't really have a desire, you know, to be an actor or anything like that um, at the the time. And so it was when I was a junior, I was at UCLA and, you know, they were like, do you want to come back to the show? And at that point, you know, the show was big enough that we could get, you know, talent agents and publicists and professionals, (laughs) adults, I put that in air quotes, people in the room who knew the value of uh, again, I'll put it in quotes, talent, yes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and helped us better negotiate uh, our positions with the network, um, you know, more rights and things like that. Right. But um, I will say that it took a couple of years and a couple of seasons. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the stars of the show were paid a lot. And, we, you know, the secondary people like myself were also paid a lot. But it took a really long time yeah. to, to get to that to get to that place. We should have been paid a lot from day one. <laughs> sure, sure. Especially given the success of the show. Right. Did you make enough in like your junior year and senior year of filming to cover the cost of college? Because I think yes. about like now with the NCAA athletes and the scholarships. So that clearly yes. covered the cost of a UCLA education. Yes. I think that there were, you know, 20 to 25 episodes a season. Okay. And at that time, you know, we were getting paid anywhere from twenty five dollars to $100,000 an episode. Oh, damn. Yeah. So more than enough. More That's than enough. That's a big change from 3K a season. Yes. <laughs> That's... More, more than enough. But we really gave our blood, sweat, and tears <laughs> to <Literally>. it. <laughs> our youth. <laughs> and, you know, as a result, um, you know, we were exposed to a lot, yeah. to so many um, benefits and, mm-hmm. and so much privilege. But also you have to deal with the emotional side of people knowing who you are. Right. Sure. What being was, in the public eye. What was like the troll situation there? You talk about like some of the, obviously we know the career, we know some of the finances of it. Mm-hmm. see the upside just based on what you said. Today we know what the troll situation is, right? Like the <laughs> online blogs yeah. and the comments and stuff. But back then social media wasn't what it was or it barely existed. No. What was some, like where would people come at you? Like how would you get the feedback? It was the gossip blogs. It was Perez Hilton. Okay. It was... All those early, early websites where yeah. <laughs> yeah, those. people were writing whatever they wanted. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it was like the beginning of digital advertising. Uh-huh. And so clicks were really important. And I mean, the, the entire media industry has moved online now. So, sure. so I feel like we've become so... Um, what's the right word? You know, like headlines barely get us anymore, right? Yeah, like the clickbait of <laughs> exactly. Those headlines but like, back okay. then, and what it was 2010, yeah. you know, the littlest thing, and the internet would explode. And so, you know, we were just tabloid fodder for a number of years. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> and we were still kids. We didn't know how to deal with it. We were not prepared for it, you know? Yeah, but how, and I think this is like maybe a lesson that anyone can take into their life as they're approaching their careers or relationships or financial struggles. But like, seriously though, how do you, you're in college. I saw that you studied history, which I was like, well, interesting. But you're studying history in college as a mega reality TV star and then getting paid mega bucks. How are you balancing all that, like mentally? Uh, you know, for me, I always loved school. Yeah. <laughs> um, I loved, you know, being part of a group. I was in a sorority, Kappa okay. Kappa Gamma, UCLA. <laughs> um, so I lived in my sorority house and I had really good friends. And um, 
you know, I just really enjoyed sort of being part of that group because that was always my goal coming out of high school was I want to go to college. My sister went to UC Berkeley and I spent so much time with her. She was older. And so I, when I was younger, got this amazing sense of what a university experience could be. And so I really understood that it could be awesome. (laughs) And I was like a fun party girl. And I was like, I'm at college. I'm going to football games. I'm, I'm doing it. Um, the benefit of being at UCLA was in your, you're in the heart of the entertainment industry in Los Angeles. And so, you know, for me, I would say that the the challenges really came down to some more like social issues. Sure. You know, I could go out with sort of the entertainment crowd and then people at school would kind of give me the side eye and then I'd hang at school for a while and, you know, go back and forth between, you know, the the crowds. The two worlds. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That is crazy. But I was a kid. I was so lucky. So really, I mean. You had the flexibility to do that. I don't have a lot to complain about. You know, it was a really fortunate situation. Right. And as a history major, though, where are you? Like, what's the trajectory of your career as you're planning? Because you got you got the TV coming in. You're, you're mm-hmm. studying history. Like, w- what is next for you on your radar? When At that, you go time, back to that time, I had no idea. Honestly, yeah. I was just starting the lowdown, <laughs> my <laughs> personal blog um, back in the day, which I don't think I've posted on in, in years. Um, I should go to the URL and see what it even looks like. <laughs> Just for old time's sake, we got to pull it up. For old time's sake, I know. Um, But I was really focused on sort of like the early days of media and content creating. And so um, I moved to New York pretty quickly after the show ended. I moved to New York City in 2012, early 2012. And so I've been in New York now for more than a decade. And the first few years I was in New York, I was really focused on content creation. It was very obvious to me that with a background in entertainment and the connections that I had that I could create, you know, a, a, a good career focused on, you know, content and working with brands and having a perspective. And so the early days for me, I, you know, was really focused on food and lifestyle content and some beauty, um, you know, run of the mill subject matter, honestly, at this point, it's 2022. And yeah. Everybody talks about that stuff. Um, but back in the day, and, and to this day, I'm a very passionate, like cook and chef. And so mm-hmm. Um, for a while I was working with my talent agents and, um, you know, the food network about possibly doing a cooking show with them. And so I went to culinary school here, French culinary school in Soho to really like develop my skills. (laughs) And, um, my program was classic French, but with a farm to table spin on it. And Dan Barber managed the curriculum and we got to go to Blue Hill Stone Barn a lot. And it was a really fantastic program. And so I really learned a lot about, um, not only organic, sustainable eating, but also nutrition. And so through that experience, um, I really came to understand how to eat for health and wellness. And so I started to become really passionate about that topic. And I've always been a mega science and biology nerd. Um, I wanted to be a doctor, but I just like couldn't get through pre-med. <laughs> like, I'm bad at math. It's so sad that you have to be good at math to be a doctor. Yeah, and, right. Like, make, get an A in chemistry. Chemistry is brutal. It's like, come on, man. Um, and it was also during this period that um, what I was working with with the Food Network didn't get picked up, like didn't get push forward into production. They were like, we don't want you anymore, which happens all the time in the entertainment industry constantly. (laughs) They're like, we want you actually, we don't want you. Um, and so I, you know, had that disappointment of everything that I had sort of been working for. And so like what year is this? This is, um, this is like 2014, 2015. Okay. Um, so like the, the food stuff, like or sort of that door closed in okay. terms of, you know, media and entertainment. And yeah. it was at this time that I started to become sick and I was like depressed and anxious for the first time, but overwhelmingly so. I felt like something was really off, yeah. really bad dizziness, vertigo, all of these things. And I started to really look into what was going on with me from a physical health perspective yeah. because I just was okay one day and then the next day I wasn't. And um, it took 18 months to figure it out. Wow. But finally, my primary care, primary care doctor was like, you have really severe vitamin deficiencies and oh. it's stemming from like these gut health issues, et cetera. And so honestly, every part of my health was affected. And at Love Wellness, we really focus on gut, brain, vaginal health. Um, okay. And I started the business with 
uh, personal care products because at the time I was having all of these gut health issues and getting all of these infections. I was at the OBGYN constantly. And I came to discover that most of the personal care brands of you know, 10 years ago, sure. legacy brands, um, are the products are made and marketed as safe and effective for women, but they're really not. And I feel okay. like that has been like revealed to women mm-hmm. now, you know, you like look at these ingredient lists and you understand that all of these chemicals can be really bad, sure. can disrupt your microbiome, et cetera. And so basically formed this thesis or yeah. hypothesis <laughs> that, um, you know, if I focused on natural, clean products and healing the gut, then my like personal health would improve. And I was right, but there were very few products and brands in the market back in you know 2015 that were addressing the true like biological needs of women's bodies, which is to focus on a healthy microbiome, vaginal pH, et cetera, et cetera, and. So I sort of decided to just go for it, uh-huh. and I launched Love Wellness. I've always been entrepreneurial, yeah, and I always knew I wanted to do something, but this really became my opportunity to build something that was uniquely my own, that I was incredibly passionate about. And this was back in the day of, like, Casper and Glossier being big, and these, like, Brands with a capital B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was nothing for women's health <laughs> yeah, literally. that was like that. Nothing. Yeah. It was like, here's the tampon aisle, and it's <laughs> really bad. And I just kind of felt like there was a huge opportunity to create a brand for women that allows you whole body harmony, yeah. but with beautiful packaging, clean ingredients, and the education to go alongside it, right? Because that was really missing. Totally. And so now... Um, you know, we're one of the best-selling personal care brands in the United States. We have full distribution in Target, Ulta, Amazon, wellness.com. Wow. So it's been a really interesting and, and exciting journey. That is a wild transition. Yeah. Like, so like one of the, the book I wrote is called The Restart Roadmap, right? Yeah. It's taking one opportunity and totally pivoting to the next one. Hard pivot. Hard, hard pivot, hard pivot. I mean, hard so you go pivot. reality TV to culinary to potentially food entertainment to then this this downfall, which actually ends up leading Correct. to the launch pad for you. A quick question on the reality TV front, and then mm-hmm. I want to get into the business. At what point in your cycle of these changes and pivots did you say to yourself, "There's, I'm not going back to that. I'm now focused on this. I'm always, I've always been really good at making decisions and moving forward yeah. because I have always had the understanding that I can just make another decision. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a – it's such a bit like a basic philosophy, but it's one like no one gets. And there's so yeah. much fear that will will drive decision making because we're scared of the consequences. Yeah. But to your point, you can just make another one. You can just make another decision. For me, that has always been easy and I've done it since I was a kid. You know, I think my family growing up thought I was a little – like flaking all over the place. They're like, this year you like this, next year you like this. And it turns out that as humans, we're allowed to have many pursuits and delights and they just turn us into more fulfilled, more complete, well-rounded people. (laughs) So well said. And so at least that's my opinion on it. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, like I said, if you make a decision and you don't like it, you can always just make another decision. So I've never been afraid of that, right? I moved to New York. At one point, I moved back to LA. I moved back to New York. I started this business. I did this. And I I just don't live in fear of those decisions. I live Uh, in fear of other things, sure. But decision making has has always been a strong suit for me. (laughs) I love that because I think like one of the my thesis is that like we have this blueprint that like society and culture will put us in Mm -hmm. and then we think that there's x y and z we have to do to achieve success in the definition that's been created by what's been instilled on us right like go to school take out debt go work nine to five Mm -hmm. exceed expectations and try to get promoted etc and to your point it's it's taking those pivots it's taking uh, making one decision falling on your face to then learn what can come next and i Mm -hmm. think it's a simple philosophy that not many people do that that clearly you have been able to take on Yeah, I think honestly part of it is because I just don't really care what anybody thinks about me or the decisions that I make. And I think that comes back to my experience on TV because I had to develop really thick skin early on just to survive through it. (laughs) That's so true. And so I've just been living as that person 
yeah. for a really long time. This is my world, and you can say whatever you want, but I'm going to live it my way. And I, I mean, it's such a great philosophy. When you talked about, you said some words there that I wasn't aware of, and maybe some of the uh, listeners are, are not, but I got to ask. I knew the pH balance and what that meant. This is why I knew that. If you want a funny story, Caitlin was filming for like three months when she was filming The Bachelorette. She mm-hmm. came back and she's like, you used all my pH soap. And I was like, <laughs> that's the body wash, right? And she's like, no, Jason, that's not what that is. It's for so, uh, I personal learned. hygiene. It's for personal hygiene. Yeah. I learned that. External personal External hygiene. External personal hygiene. <laughs> so I will never touch that again. That is for her. It could. It's fine. It's it just, fine? It, it actually will probably be really great for your skin because nice. a lot of these solutions are acidic. And so okay. probably some like exfoliating happening. <laughs> okay. We got some good exfoliating. <laughs> You'll be fine. I'll be fine. You'll be fine. Now, the other word you said that went into, and I don't know anything about science. And so you're dealing with uh, not even a one-on-one, but that went into your business creation was, mm-hmm. you said, microbiomes? Don't, man, don't you know what the microbiome is? I don't. Do and you for, take a probiotic? I do. Okay. Well, then you are taking care of your microbiome. Okay. So for, for the one other person that might be listening, because <laughs> it sounds like this is like common sense, break down what the microbiome is and how it impacted like your gut health. Like, sure. So there's different microbiomes all over your body, in and on your body. And like your master microbiome is the one that lives in your gut. And it's like the billions of bacteria and like pathogens and all the stuff that like live inside of you basically. So it's actually not you. It's like not self versus like, okay, the difference between self and not self is self is your tissues, your blood, not self are like bacteria, viruses, things like that. Got it. So your microbiome is actually probably your most powerful immunity. You could kind of consider it an organ. But interestingly enough, it's not self. It's all this bacteria. Interesting. Um, Bacteria are the great regulators in the body. So if you think about like an Amazon warehouse Mm -hmm. and all of the like robots moving around, sending orders different places, and think about little bacteria standing there with clipboards being like, hey, like send this here do this yeah your bacteria in your microbiome are actually responsible for sort of telling your organs like hey make more or less of this hormone send it here do all these things and so people think that you know bacteria in the microbiome are really only responsible for healthy digestion and things like that but it turns out bacteria like we are we basically are just a big ball of bacteria <laughs> <Lovely. laughs> keeping us healthy um helping our immune systems thrive and basically making our bodies operate we're really like at the mercy of our immune system or sorry at the, the, the mercy of our microbiomes and this bacteria and so um at Love Wellness, we're really focused on supporting the microbiome, okay. uh, knowing that we live in the 21st century, right? Because the things that can disrupt the microbiome are antibiotics, over-the-counter drugs, um, alcohol, foods with preservatives in them, toxin chemicals, basically anything that can get into your body and like kill off your good bacteria or erode the lining in your stomach, which can lead to leaky gut and things getting into your blood system and making you sick. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we really focus on supporting the microbiome Okay. because it's scientifically proven that the gut is connected to the brain and the vagina. It's connected from the vagus nerve, uh, connected by these microbiomes, right? Connected by your malt and your gulch, which is like mucus that like runs all yeah. throughout your body and your bacteria live in the mucus. Yeah. So all of these systems are connected. And so if one goes down, the others have a high probability of going down. And so at Love Wellness, we really focus on personal care via the microbiome. And so, and that's what you guys focus on with the company that you own. Mm -hmm. But is, is that specifically where you were having deficiencies in your 18 months of definitely the health yeah issues. and so what was and now you have your solution because you created it but i'm curious what was the market solution at the time that you finally identified that that was the issue really my OBGYN at the time was like you really need to take probiotics and back then i didn't really understand the sure. connection I mean, between I still don't. gut health and vaginal health um but 
taking probiotics really helped me a lot. Good. And from there, your body just starts operating better across the board. Um, I could go like really deep on the science, but let's just not because it's kind of complicated. <laughs> okay. So let's say it's, it's more of a high level podcast. Basically, but- what I need you to know is that the gut is connected to the vagina and to the brain and, and vice versa. All three of those like organ systems are connected. They communicate to each other um, from something called quorum sensing, which means bacteria talk to each other. Imagine the bacteria in your vagina and the bacteria in your tummy are like texting each other, telling each other what to do. That happens. Are you sure you weren't a pre-med major? (laughs) I told you. I should have been a doctor. She knows her shit. Yeah. Okay. There's basically bacteria. Like I said, we're at the mercy of our bacteria. And if there's something wrong with them or they're not doing their jobs effectively because of the things we're putting into our body or on our body, we have a higher tendency to get sick and to have problems. And it's really hard to be well, especially in the United States, just being exposed to toxins, preservatives, things constantly. And so probiotics really do work. They really help heal people and their bodies and they make them feel a lot better. Interesting. And so at the time, there really wasn't a lot of products available in the market. There weren't a lot of solutions. But I will say, you know, Love Wellness is six years old now and we're barely scratching the surface from an education perspective, right? Most people still don't understand kind of what I'm talking about. However, the products really work and the science and the education is there. And so, you know, the probiotics category has grown tremendously over the past few years. It's like the fastest growing piece of the supplements market um, because probiotics work. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about let's, so it's so interesting to learn how you got into this space, why you got into this space and where there was a market void for the space. I'm just such a nerd. (laughs) I know it's so impressive, but what I also want to get down to is like how you actually make something like this come to fruition. So, so you, you, you know that there's a solution that's needed with that, especially mm-hmm. a product like this, I imagine there's uh, regulatory uh, things. There's probably credibility. People are like, okay, a reality TV star totally. is now creating a vitamin. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't believe it. Talk to me about the money and the strategy and the effort it took to make this thought and gap an actual real business. Yeah. So the first two years, I ran the business by myself um, wow. out of my living room in Tribeca. And I was just all in. Um, So originally, uh, at Level Wellness, we have a medical advisory board, groups of, you know, doctors, food scientists, nutritionists um, that help influence the development of our products, you know, advise on ingredients, um, you know, test, things like that. Um, But in the, uh, like, supplements and cosmetics industry in general, if you're a good brand, you follow best practices. So everything gets third party tested. All of your ingredients are clean. You know, there's there's basically like high standards that you hold yourself to. But if you work with great contract manufacturers, um, a lot of that is sort of built in. You have to have these like systems built for you, but you follow, you know, good safety practices, basically good manufacturing and safety practices. Okay. That makes, so if you align with the right manufacturer, they already have a lot of these safety practices that are set in stone. Correct. Question I have about the medical board. So that Mm -hmm. is what creates your credibility, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, is that – if someone serves on, like, how do you get people on the board? Do you have to pay them? How does that look like for someone who doesn't know how to create a board? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, doctors don't want to work for your company for free. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> uh, their expertise is expertise. Yeah. You know, you pay for that expertise. Uh, just like if you were going to hire an architect to build a house, you need somebody with, you know, the credibility and expertise in, you know, what you're trying to build from a product perspective, right? So, you know, we've worked with everybody from like cosmetic chemists to, um, to OBGYNs, right? You know, just depending on the thing that we are ideating on and and want to bring to market. Um, so originally we had a, you know, medical advisory board that advised us on the types of products to bring to market. And those were our first five personal care products, a women's probiotic that is still our best selling product today. It supports vaginal and urinary tract health. Um, we have a product that's sort of like a daily vitamin, but for women's health, it's called healthy V vitamin. Mm-hmm. Um, the killer, which is our boric acid suppositories. It's like a great 
natural alternative to like monistat i don't know if you know what that is but the women who listen will know what i'm talking about big women following so yes and then talking about the ph cleanser that you love so much (laughs) um we were one of the first brands to create safe personal care products for women because what was available in the market before was really legacy brands with really really bad chemical formulations that actually disrupt your vaginal microbiome, can cause infections, basically do the opposite of what you're hoping that they will do, (laughs) which is really like challenging to understand, but you have to go back decades and start to look at marketing, you know, that was addressed to women back in the early days of like, you know, you need to smell fresh and clean for your husband kind of a thing. (laughs) Exactly. And so this whole category of products back then was created, you know, um, as a marketing, as a stuff, marketing not a health and like, wellness stuff. exactly. It's yeah. like a marketing thing for women to be like, Oh, I need to do this. But the reality is, you know, if you're trying to take care of your body, um, you know, internally, you don't need anything, only water. Don't, don't put anything up there. Please. Yeah. Um, but if you want to use like soap externally, you can do that. It just needs to be, uh, like naturally formulated pH balanced with sensitive and like ingredients in it that are for sensitive skin that are not going to like throw everything out of whack right like if you use think about it like face soap right you're not going to use like your dove bar soap on your face right right your skin is really thin on your face like you have to take care of it same on your genitals (laughs) (laughs) no it it makes perfect perfect sense it makes perfect sense it just you know you sort of have to awaken to the information all right well that's that's where i want to go because this is the this podcast too is huge on consumer protection Uh so that is what they did back in the day as like a marketing stunt yeah this is what you should know now so when you're buying what are the things that uh consumers should be looking for and should they stay away from today so when it comes to cleansers right because a, a cleanser is a really easy entry point for anyone to buy into a personal care brand and when it comes to women's personal care products the number one thing you want to stay away from is fragrance interesting fragrance whether it's chemically derived or naturally derived tends to have hundreds of ingredients in them and it's one of the number one disruptors of your microbiome but also different kinds of hormones in your body so um, fragrance in general is not good for you when it's being applied from like a personal care perspective does the same do you think is that like a that's not a rule for men too uh, I don't know. From, okay. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I honestly don't know. Okay. But the issue is that um, there's no regulatory agency that like enforces this as law, right? And so I would say that brands that know their stuff make only unscented products for women. Got it. Okay. Um, but there's still um, confusion in the marketplace. And so even new brands still are making fragranced products, I think, to like prey on the fears of women, right? Sure. When it comes to personal hygiene. Totally. Um, I don't work for other brands, so I don't know like why they're doing it. But I mean, it's pretty common knowledge now that if you are buying lubricant wipes cleanser any of those things they should be fragrance free and made with like clean gentle ingredients yeah and still new products are being brought to market that are not being formulated in that way yeah and i think i know the answer because the research i did before this podcast the wellness economy in the sectors the dollar and cents behind this industry is nuts right so personal care and beauty almost a trillion dollar business heating uh eating healthy nutrition weight loss almost a trillion dollar business, physical activity, wellness, tourism, half a billion to 700 billion. I mean, they're, they're huge, yeah. huge dollars behind this business. So it would make sense, not saying it's ethical, but mm-hmm. it would make sense why there's so much just shit out there to sell the consumer behavior as opposed to the consumer need. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, with our retail partners, I, I see all the data and you know see what all our competitors are doing. And it's pretty, pretty... Um, amazing but also alarming yeah, <laughs> that totally. brands are still making products and doing so well and in my opinion just taking advantage of you know 
uh, you know, they're like fear-based types of products. Yeah, crazy. It's so eye-opening for the consumer. Think before you actually pick something up and buy it. Do your research to understand what it is that you're looking at. Uh, Lo, tell me about this, getting into the industry. We have had some people like the co-founder of Netflix come on Mm -hmm. and talk about how he is big on, and I've said this a few times on a few podcasts, OPM, other people's money. Yeah. (laughs) So he will only start new projects and new businesses by fundraising. Yeah. There's other people like Mark Laurie, multi-billionaire. He's like, it's going to be as much of my dollars as it can be because then I'm invested in everything investor knows mm-hmm. and I won't let it lose. Yeah. When you started this, did you bring on uh, fundraising, other partners? How'd you get it up and going? Because this is a cost intensive business yeah. to get going. Yeah. So um, I've done a combo. Okay. When I started the business, it was so early that I don't think even if I tried to fundraise, I would have had a shot in hell. <laughs> <laughs> you were one of the first reality TV people that came from reality TV too that used that leverage yeah. to create a business like this. Too. I guess for me, the focus is I've always been interested in entrepreneurship and yeah. I never wanted to go back to reality TV yeah. or entertainment once I kind of had the pull, the rug pulled out from under me because it, it was just not consistent. It didn't feel safe. Sure, There's no steady paycheck. And sure. for me, like... That terrifies me. So I was like, I need a normal job, man. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm going to create it, damn it. And I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it so. Um, When I started the business, I was fortunate enough to have a little bit of savings left from my time on the hills. Awesome. I think it cost a hundred-ish thousand dollars to start my business. But, you know, this was er early days. I think the first inventory runs were like 1,000 units of each SKU. (laughs) And I like built the Shopify website myself. So the real overhead the first few years was just inventory. Um, But to date, we've raised about $25 million. Wow. Um, We're private equity backed. Nice. Um, And and we're profitable and and growing really, really quickly. Um, So, you know, fortunately, Mm -hmm. I actually was able to put my own money at the beginning because it allows me still a you know great position on my cap table yeah um so you know i think for an experienced entrepreneur with a proven track record it's great to go raise other people's money Mm -hmm. because you know what to do with it sure (laughs) and so you know you pretty much are um you know, you, you feel really good about, you know, your piece of ownership and sort of like what you can do with it. It's your skill set that you're bringing to the table once right. you are a proven entrepreneur, right? right? Totally. You don't need to invest your own money because it's like I'm bringing my, my genius sure, to, the, to table. the table. You guys put the bucks forward. <laughs> yeah. But six years ago, you know, I was a first time founder and figuring it out myself. And oh. so in that regard, I've just been so, so fortunate to be able to invest my own money, but then also have this incredible success. It's not common. Yeah. Oh, no, no. In fact, it's actually, we'll talk about some of the statistics in the recap, right? But most first time founders for sure fall on their face and fail and, and start like, I mean, over and over and over. The numbers aren't in a first time founder's uh, uh, favor, but yeah. that's amazing that you did it. It's like being struck by light. It's, <laughs> it's like so weird. But you did it. You crushed it. You, and we'll talk I guys know, in the recap. It's so conf- bizarre. If you're, if you're, yeah, it's awesome. But if you're, if anyone's confused about the PE back, stuff i'll hit it in the recap we're going to keep going when you have the product though you have the SKUs. obviously you've had success moving the product mm-hmm. from a marketing perspective yeah what has been one of the best returning investments has it been investing in celebrities influencer yeah. marketing retail landing the target deal like what's been the one of the best marketing moves yeah so you? so two things um, when it comes to you know digital advertising it was the early days of facebook back when you yeah. know audiences were attributable and, you know, we were getting like seven to one returns, the early, early days. And then the second biggest needle mover for us as a brand was launching in Target. And so this was two years ago. Um, We launched in the natural beauty section, which is basically like the clean makeup aisle at Target. And, you know, the the brand, um, this was a really interesting case study for the brand because you think about a personal care brand and supplements and you're like, oh, belongs in vitamins or the tampon aisle. But we actually um, outperform beauty in their own aisle, wow. which is really interesting. So Crazy. Target had, um, you know, seen our success at Ulta because we launched their first Ulta as a beauty retailer. Of course. And we did really well out of the gate at Ulta. You know, our vaginal suppositories, like one of the best selling products at Ulta, 
compared to every other product at Ulta. <laughs> there's a whole ton of them. No, wow. Thousands and thousands, thousands of, of SKUs. SKUs. And Target saw that and was like, wow, that's incredible. We're launching this brand in natural beauty. And so to be at Target is kind of the most priceless billboard for a consumer brand, I think, in the sure. world. And um, we just got so lucky that we were early enough in that aisle to really make a statement you know, visually with the aesthetic of the bottles, but also, you know, with the performance of the products. And it was like, hey, there's vaginal care products in the makeup aisle. Mm -hmm. And because the makeup aisle is a place where women want to go and want to stay and hang out and look at stuff yeah. versus the tampon aisle where you're like, oh, my grab God, and go you grab thing. and go. Yeah. Right. And so the discoverability hmm. of innovative personal care turns out works way better in a different part of the store. The psychology behind the story, yeah. things you never think about when you go in. Totally. How about late? So someone, let's say someone's listening to this and they know someone or they have their product. It's set. It's selling. The question they say is, how does someone get into a Target? How do you get into a Target? Oh, gosh. I mean, um, is it just like, what is like the, the quick answer to something like that? It's it probably really isn't hard. Like, it's really hard. Um, if, for me, this is where my experience in entertainment has really blessed me in my life and provided me with so much privilege because now retailers generally are looking for brands that have some kind of like extra zhuzh that they can bring to the table, Got it. right? The ability to market to a mass audience for little to no money, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, since the inception of the brand, I've been able to talk about it on my own social media channels and connect with my audience. And so being able to do that is one of the things that retailers really look for at this point is, you know, somebody that has an audience that they can connect to. And it's why you see so many people in media start companies yep. because, you know, you can't um, put a price on the value of free media. And you were very early to that game, uh, yeah. many steps ahead of the majority. Um, tell us a little bit about, we talked about how the company started, uh, how you got it up and running some of the dollars and cents and stuff there. Tell us where it is today. How many employees do you have? Where are your offices? Where can people find it? Yes. Um, we're located in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, we are about 30 employees. We are actively recruiting. We'll hopefully be 40 by the end of the year, but we prefer to keep our team small and mighty. Um, and you can find us at Target in the natural beauty aisle, in the vitamin aisle now, <laughs> in the tampon aisle now. Um, we have our own section at Ulta Beauty. We have a great Amazon store. And, um, you know, Amazon, like people are like, oh, am I getting the real deal? But Love Wellness has its own brand store on Amazon and then lovewellness.com. I love it. I could ask you a million questions, but we can, I know I got to wrap up here shortly. Now, knowing that you're hiring, what's the number one tip you would give someone if they came into an interview and wanted to land a job with you? Oh, my gosh. Um, I would ask me really challenging questions. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> uh, to, to be honest, but I mean, I like tried to recruit somebody off the street today. <laughs> they no were way. They were walking in the same direction I was on, on Prince towards Broadway in Soho. And a girl was like, Hey, like, are you low? And immediately was, I was like, yeah. And we were walking in the same direction. And so I was like, Oh, what do you do? What's your name? Cause we were just continuing to walk in the same direction. Sure. And she was like, Oh, my name's this. And, um, she told me where she worked and what she did. And I know that we're recruiting in that area. Wow. And so I was like, well, here's my email. <laughs> Look at that. There's the takeaway. One interaction, one conversation could change your life. Yes, that's the takeaway. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. And very impressive. All right. Let's do a couple quick rapid fire. People are going to want to know from you, Lo, what sort of personal health routines do you have now? on a day-to-day -day basis? I just practice a really good balance of, of work life because I work a lot. <laughs> but I, from the beginning, because I've like, you know, had all of these illnesses I've had to deal with, have like really had to take care of my body too. So I leave work at five o'clock every day. <laughs> five o'clock. I'm like, bye wow. guys. God and I you. encourage people to do the same. I get home, I take a bath. I have a under the desk treadmill now at the office and I can pump out like eight to 10 miles a day. While you're working. Yeah, while I'm working. Wow. So I really try to give my body what it needs, both from a movement, food and rest perspective. 
Okay. In addition to just trying to get the job done. <laughs> and setting, I think the setting boundaries too, is that something? Oh yeah, boundary I'm setting. I'm big on that and I'm, I'm good at it. <laughs> I'm, I'm like terrible. five o'clock, bye. <laughs> okay, one thing that you said to me that's still sticking with me is when you made the comment about how alcohol impacts the, the bacteria. Mm-hmm. It's the summer. A lot of my listeners are drinking. Me I'll too. be drinking this weekend. <laughs> Do I'm you, ready for my martini I'm now. I'm ready for a martini <laughs> now. Uh, but tell me if you are drinking this summer, what are some things you could do to like combat that impact it has on your so my well. endocrinologist because uh, I asked her she was like y- you know you need to not not drink less but I'm basically doing an elimination diet right now because okay. I've like had some gut health issues again so okay. it just goes to show even a wellness founder can like still <laughs> <laughs> have, have, have problems <laughs> because I live in New York City and I like live my life but I was like okay can I drink and she was like, yes, but try to focus on mezcal, mezcal on the rocks with like a squeeze of lime and only drink that. Interesting. And I was like, okay. And I think it's because there's, you know, little sugar in it, no mixers. I've never been big on mixers, yeah, but yeah. I think um, I'm sure it's still not good for your microbiome. But like if you are drinking something that is clean as possible with as few fillers in it, definitely the okay. right way to go. So just try to like stick to clear liquids on ice. Clear liquids. I'm really encouraging (laughs) crazy drinking right now. Totally change my consumption. (laughs) I'll be ordering mezcal all weekend. Mezcal for dinner. All right. We're still in rapid fire phase. What do you think is the most commonly asked question that you get, whether it's on the streets or in interviews, about the whole Laguna Beach and Hills experience in your life? Was it real? Was it real? And your answer? Most of it was not real, (laughs) honestly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> by the end, by the last few seasons, it was pretty scripted. Gotcha. All right. There's your answer. And then my the last question I have in the rapid fire is looking at your career today, looking at where your career was, do you think there's any bit of you that might enter the entertainment space in regards to like reality television or entertainment again? I think I could like sit on Shark Tank and maybe Ooh, that's, that's, that that's kind of it. But I'm not going back to reality TV, like traditional reality TV. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, little one-off appearances here and there, you know, with like an entrepreneurship sure. focus. Cause that's where I can actually add value. Add like, value. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to like <laughs> add a, value. reading a script. <laughs> yeah. That's where I can add value now because of everything that I've learned. I can, um, so. Okay. I love it. I could talk to you forever. The last question I'll ask you before we go into your trading secret would be if you did part, cause we've had a couple sharks from Shark Tank on the show. Mm. Uh, what shark would you want to partner with on your business if you could? Oh, Definitely Mark Cuban. 100%. 100%. I love it. Cuban's my guy. That's exactly, exactly (laughs) what Barbara Corcoran said. He's the best shark to partner with. Yeah. Um, Amazing. All right. Well, this has been wildly educational, informational. I already feel healthier talking to you, knowing what I'm going to put into my system. Probiotics galore. (laughs) Uh, Trading secret. So a piece of advice as it relates to money management, career management, or life management that someone can't find in a classroom or Google. They can only learn from your experience. What is one trading secret you can leave us with? My dad taught me this. Okay. Loose lips sink ships. Ooh, okay. Don't tell your secrets. Don't count your chickens before they've hatched. Ooh. It's not meat till it's in your mouth. <laughs> oh, I like it. Her trading secret is give no secrets. Give no secrets. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new one, but it's one we'll take. Lo, thank you so much for being here. Where can people find you, Love Wellness, and everything that uh, you have going on when and if they want to purchase the product or ask you a couple questions or maybe even apply to the company? Yeah, absolutely. Lovewellness.com. You get the best discounts on subscriptions there. Our jobs are posted there on LinkedIn, um, and I'm at Low Bosworth on Instagram and TikTok. There you go. Check out TikTok. Check out our Instagram. <laughs> Lo, thank you so much for being here with us, and make sure to tune into the recap. We got a whole lot to literally, figuratively, and physically digest. We'll be talking more. Thanks.